We are very glad to have um, you, uh, I may have uh, Dr. Ludlum uh, speak to us today. Dr. Ludlum uh, is currently the um, Chief Medical Officer and Vice President of Clinical Development at uh, Ricordati uh, Rare Diseases, Inc. Uh, he obtained his uh, MD, PhD from the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, uh, and I realized that he was a MD, PhD candidate uh, at the same time that I was doing my fellowship uh, at Einstein. Um, he subsequently did his um, uh, residency training um, in internal medicine uh, at Oregon Health Sciences Center and went on to do fellowship in endocrinology under Dr. Lynn Luria, who is uh, well known in the field of uh, endocrinology and particularly in pituitary and adrenal disease. Uh, he then uh, stayed at uh, the Oregon Health Sciences uh, Center where he started the first uh, uh, pituitary unit uh, and um, he was there until 2006 and subsequently moved to Seattle where he uh, again started another pituitary center at the Swedish Medical Center. In 2012, he moved to um, uh, industry where he has been uh, working, uh, developing different uh, uh, products for Novartis uh, and then Chiasma and now with uh, Ricordati. Uh, he has um, focused his uh, uh, studies uh, on uh, pituitary disorders. Uh, he has also been active uh, in uh, different uh, societies. He has been on the Corporate Liaison Board of the Endocrine Society and, uh, and the Research Affairs Core Committee of the Endocrine Society. Uh, he has been involved in multiple clinical trials, both before and after um, uh, his um, um, you know, entry into the uh, Ricordati uh, Inc. And he has several publications, particularly in the uh, field of uh, pituitary diseases uh, and um, uh, the management of uh, Cushing's and acromegaly. We are very glad to have him here today to speak to us uh, about uh, uh, Cushing's disease and uh, the management of um, this in the current age. So, Dr. Ludlum, welcome and you can take over. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Sri. And you can see the correct screen now? Yes. Wonderful. Okay. Well, again, so I'm uh, uh, Bill Ludlum, uh, CMO at Recordati right now. Uh, Recordati is a kind of a newer company in the endocrine space. Uh, they purchased, uh, acquired a couple of drugs from Novartis uh, that had really begun to, you know, obviously Novartis developed uh, Octria, well, Sandoz before Novartis, but Novartis really uh, carried the torch on uh, Sandostatin, uh, which is important for the treatment of acromegaly and also neuroendocrine uh, tumors. And they began to build, develop a pipeline of drugs, which they ultimately divested that Record Audi picked up. So this is uh, some drugs that I've had now probably 15 plus years of experience with. I started with them as an investigator, uh, performing clinical trials, then uh, 2012 joined Novartis, continued to develop these drugs. And I'll give you a little bit of history as we go along. And uh, I then stepped away, as was just mentioned, uh, developed oral octreotide, <coughs> mycapsa. Uh, for acromegaly, and then uh, once uh, Chiasma was sold to Amrit, uh, I, I joined Recordati and, and continued to work uh, on these drugs for the last about year and a half I've been with Recordati. So I'm going to speak today. So despite now being in industry, um, I'm a physician first and foremost and a scientist, and so my commitment to you today is to just talk about the disease. Uh, I, you know, as was just mentioned, uh, built and uh, managed patients in two different pituitary centers. Uh, so a lot of personal experience managing Cushing's disease. So I'm gonna talk about the diagnosis and, diagnosis and management of Cushing's. And then I'm gonna talk about uh, the two drugs for Cushing's that Recordati currently has. And I'll base that information right out of the peer reviewed phase three studies in a very unbiased manner. And then ultimately we'll finish up with um, a review of glucocorticoid withdrawal syndrome, which is very important to understand as you manage patients with Cushing's. So disclosures, as just mentioned, I'm the CMO at Recordati. Um, the outline of what we're gonna talk about. And so let's jump right in then to Cushing's disease and we'll start with background. Uh, the first thing to, to recognize, well, first of all, Cushing's 
uh, Cushing's is, is, a, is a surgeon, right? Harvey Cushing's often referred to as the, the grandfather of neurosurgery, uh, developed many very innovative things that revolutionized neurosurgery, including uh, controversial ideas like monitoring people's blood pressure during surgery and making sure they have better outcomes. Um, he, one of the things that he is known for is identifying a very unusual disease, the original uh, patient, her name, we know her as Minnie G. We know her first initial of her last name, Minnie, first name G, last name. And she presented, and his description of Minnie G is classic Cushing's. It could be, could have been used in a, in a, in a clinic note today. Um, and, and we'll talk about those features in just a moment. But just in terms of thinking about Cushing's, most Cushing's syndrome which is when we talk, when I talk about Cushing syndrome, I'm gonna talk about endogenous Cushing syndrome, which is really caused by a, some sort of pathology, a tumor within the body. Obviously the most common cause of high steroid levels is iatrogenic, as doctors giving people high dose steroid for lung disease, bone disease, all kinds of different things that we, we throw steroids around with. But endogenous tumor caused you can really think about it in two categories, um, ACTH dependent and ACTH independent. So let's talk about dependent first. Well, that basically means there is a source that the tumor is making ACTH, and that's what's driving the pathology. So the, if you remember your HPA axis, the uh, normally uh, ACTH is coming from the pituitary gland, travels down to the adrenals, causes the adrenals to make cortisol, and then there's feedback back to the hypothalamus and pituitary, which regulates the ACTH. If you have a tumor making ACTH, that whole regulatory process pathway is now hijacked. And, and if you think about ACTH dependent, it really falls into two major categories. The majority, now this is 70% of all endogenous Cushing's, um, is Cushing's disease or uh, uh, Cushing's caused by a pituitary tumor overproducing ACTH. There are ectopic ACTH sources, and the most common in those are, are lung cancer, small cell lung cancer. So if you have a uh, ACTH source uh, causing hypercortisolemia and it's not coming from the pituitary, think lung first, but then it can be a variety of other top other areas as well. The other category is ACTH independent. And what that means is that the tumor is, or is either producing, um, producing cortisol itself. And so the cortisol is high, and so the ACTH then gets suppressed because the pituitary is still, is still normal in this. And so high cortisol, low ACTH, ACTH independent. The vast majority of these are gonna be adrenal adenomas. Uh, good news is, if it is an adenoma and it's unilateral, they're generally fairly easy to resect and, and actually can, can get a very high cure rate in these patients. The other ACTH dependent forms are gonna be more difficult and we'll talk about that management here in a bit. So Cushing's disease, which is what I'm gonna focus on now, uh, caused by ACTH secreting pituitary adenoma. You can see here the pituitary, ACTH going down to the adrenals, driving cortisol production. Um, there is a mortality rate associated with Cushing's about that equivalent of some cancers from, you know, two to five times the mortality ratio. Cardiovascular disease is very common in these patients, hypertension, heart disease, uh, infectious diseases. Uh, the cortisol suppresses the immune system and, and leaves patients subject. And then a whole variety of metabolic complications. So those are sort of some buckets of uh, the, the, the sequelae of Cushing's, and I'll show another slide in just a moment, breaking those down even a little bit more. It's about three times, three to five times, depending on what, what papers you're looking at, more prevalent in women, particularly young women. So often this is referred to as a young woman's disease, but having seen lots of Cushing's, I can tell you it presents in men as well. One of the, the questions is always, is it being missed more? We know a lot of Cushing's is being missed period, is it just being missed more in men? Uh, because for example, in women where they lose their menses, they get an aggressive workup and it, and it can be identified. Um, in terms of uh, 
incidents. It's uh, the classic numbers that we use is about 1.2 to 2.4 per million with about roughly 40 cases per million. There's uh, some newer data that's come out. This is probably the most commonly cited numbers, but um, you know, for example, out of uh, you know some of the European studies, um, Iceland, et cetera, you know, up to 70 cases per million or even over 100 in some studies. So there's a real question as to what is the true incidence of the disease. It doesn't appear to be country specific. It's probably more healthcare specific, and and, pay, and doctors being able to think about it and have the means to work it up and diagnose it. Uh, there was a U.S. study uh, done by Michael Broder looking at claims analyses that had the numbers probably three times higher than this. So uh, it will be an ongoing debate and question what the true incidence is. Bottom line is it's rare, and the biggest challenge to diagnosing the disease is ultimately thinking about it. Um, let me back up just a little bit in terms of pituitary tumors themselves. Uh, about half are non-functioning, um, and these are clinically relevant non-functioning. Uh, if you do just autopsy studies, one in five people have a small pituitary adenoma that they never knew about, right? There's adenomas all over the body. So when we talk about half of pituitary tumors being non-functioning, we're referring to things that are typically macro adenomas that are causing some kind of a problem because of space occupying lesion, vision, damage to the pituitary, headaches, et cetera. So the other half then are really broken up into hormonally active tumors. The vast majority of the, the remainder of these tumors are, are prolactinomas, lactotroph tumors. And these are fortunately fairly easy to treat with dopamine agonists. Um, and then the somatotroph or GH producing or acromegaly or gigantism, 10, 11%, and the corticotroph somewhere around 7, 10% as well. Uh, these are ACTH producing tumors. And then the real rarities, the, the LH and FSH producing tumors or the TSH producing tumors are quite rare even for, for pituitary uh, treatment centers. All right, so let's get into now back to Cushing's. And of course, anytime someone shows a lecture and, and pictures, they're always showing the, the florid cases. And the problem is, rarely does, does Cushing's present this clearly, which is one of the reasons it can be such a long diagnosis. But it sometimes helps to see the, the florid presentation uh, so that you can then have that in your mind and you can begin to recognize more subtle presentations. So first thing is the facial rounding and facial plethora. You'll notice the redness in her cheeks. Uh, when I was doing uh, my science fellowship, uh, I had a technician. Uh, she was a Chinese and had been a Chinese physician, and she started asking me one day because she saw me running off to clinic all the time managing these rare patients. She said, what, what disease do you work with? And I said, well, I, one of them I, I work a lot with is Cushing's disease, and she said she had never heard of it. And so I started to describe it, and she goes, oh, full moon disease. And so in China, it's actually referred to because of the facial rounding as, as it really looks like a full moon. And once, once we had our terminology down, she completely knew what I did and, and could relate. So central obesity with, with uh, proximity, uh, extremity wasting. So here's an individual, you see all the fat around the midsection with proximal muscle wasting and weakness. Another thing, and this is probably larger than any tumor or any buffalo hump that I've seen, is sometimes referred to as the buffalo hump or the dorsus cervical fat pad. And this literally can be extending all the way down the back, just literally looks like, a, like the back of a buffalo. Uh, but there's often deposits of uh, uh, dorsal cervical fat. Um, now, on all of these features, and as we get here, the first thing to think about is you see these all the time. You get a diabetic patient or an obese patient, and this is one of the problems is the hallmark, the compilation of the syndrome of Cushing's and, and the features are fairly common, and it's only when you put them all together and begin to see that this patient is really dysfunctional does people do people begin to think Cushing's uh, and begin to do that workup. So we talked about the facial plethora. There's bone loss. There's stria, so large violaceous uh, purple, red purple stretch marks. I already mentioned this proximal muscle weakening, uh, myopathies, um, w skin th thinning, and bruising. Um, all kinds of uh, GI issues, decreased libido, menstrual irregularities. Uh, we mentioned the, the moon faces and central obesity and, and, and uh, 
a variety of other neuropsychiatric issues, depression and others. Uh, acne is often a, uh, a hallmark of the disease as well. Then there's a whole series of uh, associated uh, diseases, hypertension, diabetes, uh, we talked about infections, uh, heart disease, et cetera. Um, so next slide here, I'm mentioning these, the, the obesity, the hypertension, diabetes, and insulin um, uh, tolerance issues, uh, osteoporosis, and depression. Um, in terms of mortality, I mentioned a little earlier that are somewhere between 2 and 5% increase mortality risk. You can see when you look at the cohort of Cushing's disease compared to a matched a comparison cohort, there's a significantly increased uh, risk of mortality associated with the disease. Good news is that as you begin to control the disease, you begin to normalize and bring back this mortality risk back into, uh, into the normal range. So cortisol in remission, controlled disease, begin to start crossing that normal line. Persistent or uncontrolled can be up to four to five times uh, higher mortality rate. So unhappy patients, serious comorbidities, important to treat. And the good news is when you do treat, you can give these patients their lives back and improve not only all the comorbidities and the signs and symptoms and features of the disease, but the mortality risk as well. So let's talk a little bit about diagnosis. And often, and when I do lectures like this, where people want to drill down, um, one of my favorite quotes is by a friend of mine named Jay Finling who once said, if you've never misdiagnosed Cushing's disease, you probably should be referring your patients to someone who has. And, and what he's getting at is anyone who has done this for any period of time has gotten it wrong because this is a complicated disease. And we have all these very neat and tidy uh, treatment algorithms and diagnostic algorithms, and I'll even show you one here in just a minute out of guidelines. But when it really comes down to some of the more complicated cases, you can get it wrong. It's kind of uh, almost analogous to what I learned about in medical school, which was um, uh, appendicitis, right? And, and so sometimes there's just, there is a chance you're going to overdiagnose and there's a chance you're going to underdiagnose, but you want to get it right as much as you can. Okay, so here's one of those algorithms. So the first thing is you're suspecting Cushing's disease. Um, and you've ruled out uh, exogenous glucocorticoids. Nobody's just taking prednisone or dexamethasone or something. You then perform one of these tests, and I like this algorithm in that it gets at really how I think about this disease is three major categories of testing. One is the overall elevation in cortisol, and that's picked up but in the urine where, you know, if you think about uh, one of the analogies I, I, I often use is, is I say, if you have a one gallon bucket and you pour two gallons of water into the one gallon bucket, how much do you have in the one gallon bucket when you're done? And the answer is one gallon, all the rest of it spilled out. And in some ways, that's really what you're seeing when your cortisol goes up. There's only going to be so much typically in the serum. It's going to spill out and it's going to spill out into the urine. So the urine can be a very good test in an, in an integrator of overall cortisol production over a 24-hour span. The late-night salivary gets at a slightly different question. You can actually have an abnormal axis where you have a tumor that's maybe not quite as high to drive the overall average cortisol up, but you've thrown off your diurnal pattern. It's hijacked the HPA, and so you have too much cortisol uh, uh, in, in the morning. Um, Sorry, I'm going to say this the other way around. You've got too much in the evening, but you may not actually have elevated in the morning yet. And so your area under the curve may actually be normal, but it's all at the wrong place. It's like having your feet in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the oven and your head in the freezer. On average, you may be normal. You may come out with a normal urine-free cortisol, but you're going to throw off that diurnal pattern where it should be highest in the, in the, in the morning and lowest in zero at midnight. So if you do a midnight salivary test and they're elevated, you're getting a sign that there is an abnormal diurnal pattern. So that's the second category of tests that I like. And then the last category of tests are suppressibility. If you give, I mentioned earlier on, if you, when the a cortisol begins to go up, it feeds back to the hypothalamus and pituitary and suppresses cortisol. So if you give steroid, you should be suppressing ACTH and then endogenous cortisol production. 
And so that's exactly what's happening when you give somebody dexamethasone, you should be suppressing down to zero cortisol production. If you're not, that's a sign that you have lack of suppressibility. So the three categories, overall, excess cortisol, loss of diurnal pattern, and loss of suppressibility. Once you begin to see these tests are normal, Cushing's is unlikely. If they continue to be elevated, um, you, be, you, you want to repeat them, and then you want to go on to some others. This slide's slightly dated. There is no more CRH, but we have other, other equivalent tests. But you can just even the dexamethasone are pretty good tests. You can begin to go down the Cushing's workup. And uh, again, if these continue to be abnormal, it's making hypercortisolemia or Cushing's uh, syndrome likely. And then you go on. Once you know you have high cortisol, you begin to ask the question, is it ACTH? dependent or independent. If it's dependent, then you've got to ask the question, is it coming from the pituitary or is it coming from somewhere else? And one very good way to do that is something called a petrosal, inferior petrosal sinus sampling or IPSS where catheters are fed in through the venous system and the groin, up through the body, up through, bypass the heart, up the, um, through the neck, and then literally put the, the, these catheters right next to the pituitary gland in the, in the cavernous sinus or inferior petrosal sinus. And, uh, and sample blood on each side of the pituitary and compare the ACTH gradient, gradient to what's happening peripherally. And if there's no gradient and your ACTH is high, it's coming from somewhere other than your pituitary. Okay, um, there's a more current uh, uh, guidelines. This one that I was just showing you is from 2005, I believe. I'm not seeing it immediately on here. Yep, uh, 2008. Um, and there's uh, one more recently come out uh, in 2021 uh, from the Endocrine Society, but a lot of very similar principles uh, being outlined. Let's talk a little bit about treatment of Cushing's. So first line therapy, I think most people agree, is a transphenoidal surgery, TS TSS, by an experienced surgeon. The more experienced the surgeon, the more volume they have, there is the, 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 there's a steep uh, improvement curve. And so the best results are coming from surgeons that have experience. If you go to the ER doc down the street, um, uh, you're probably not going to get a good outcome. I had one patient once come to me and said, yeah, uh, I, my endocrinologist said they thought I had Cushing's. I went to a surgeon and he said there was no Cushing's. He said all he found was this uh, little white milky substance in my pituitary gland. And I kind of hit my head and I said, that was it. He got he got the pituitary tumor and he scrambled it, so now we've got a real mess to deal with. But having a surgeon recognize and understand the principle that these are often white, milky tumors uh, can be very liquidy, and you want to try to carve out the pseudocapsule so you can take out this pea-sized tumor intact and give the patient the highest chance of a cure rate. However, in the best hands, there's about 50% uh, lack of success rate. Uh, often centers will report numbers 80, 90% success rate. Well, one, they're picking their most florid cases and they're sort of cherry picking things. But two, that's often initial uh, cure rates. And if you go out a few years, the actual cure rate in Cushing's from surgery starts dropping pretty low. The overwhelming likelihood is when a patient has Cushing's disease, they're going to be looking at some point at something other than just simply surgery. So um, just in terms of surgery, again, I mentioned the experienced surgeon. Uh, you want to, you know, people that are good surgical candidates. Uh, the goal is to have definitive therapy and actually remove the tumor. However, in some cases, just to reduce tumor load, if it's a larger tumor, macroadenoma, it's already had cavernous sinus invasion, for example, debulking a tumor is not a bad idea either. Protect that optic chiasm, and protect the pituitary gland and give you less tumor burden to have to overcome with medical and other therapies. There are some risks of transmittal surgery. Uh, they're fairly minimal, and most mortality rates that are reported are about 0.1%, so one in a 1,000 patients uh, dying from the surgery, which is, is fairly, fairly good, fairly safe. Okay, um, how do you monitor over time? Well, probably one of the, the standards is looking at a post-operative cortisol of less than two micrograms per deciliter. It really comes down to what your, your lab measures at. If, you can, if your lab goes to below one, that really ought to be your goal. The goal is to get cortisol suppressed to zero. So the, when, when you've had high cortisol for a long period of time because you have ACTH driving that, that cortisol that feeds back to the pituitary gland 
and the uh, hypothalamus will begin to suppress that. So when you take out that source of ACTH, your pituitary gland is, uh, is asleep. Now, one of the questions is, uh, if you do a chitrosin stimulation test immediately after pituitary surgery, is, are you going to see adrenal activity? And the question the answer actually is yes. Those adrenals are more than happy. They're more than able to stimulate. But when you bring them back six weeks later, then the adrenals have now gone to sleep. And so not only have you have pituitary has, has gone to sleep and has been suppressed, but now the adrenals themselves. And so it takes three, six months for that whole HPA axis to normalize. I start looking at about six weeks and then I'll go to three months and then six months and then eventually at some point, almost always, as long as there's not pituitary damage, that HPA axis will normalize and I'll be able to get my patient completely off, off of steroid uh, if I've been, uh, been post-surgically uh, having them on steroid replacement. If they don't need steroid after surgery, immediately after surgery, that's an, a horrible prognostic indicator that the surgery was not a success because this patient should have a suppressed pituitary. And if that tumor is gone, there should be no source of ACTH. And even though the adrenals will stimulate if you give them um, um, ACTH and an ACTH stim test, uh, that patient will not make endogenous ACTH and they'll go into adrenal insufficiency. Okay, so here I mentioned this already. These are some of the, the studies that have come out looking at post-surgical cure rates, which you can see up to 44%, nearly half the patient, even in these very large center high success rate surgeons uh, have you know, up to 50% failure rate. Um, and, and when you take all comers, community, add everybody up, it's, it's well over 50% failure rate on pituitary surgery. Okay, so let's get a little bit into pharmacologic management. And I'm, going to, I'm going to talk about all categories here. Uh, pharmacologic therapy can be used to manage high cortisol levels. Sometimes it's used before surgery uh, to bring uh, the cortisol levels down. Um, typically, in the U.S., where surgeons are able to get these patients in fairly quickly, best thing you can do for this patient is get them surgically treated, get those cortisols down endogenously, and then deal with what you've got to deal with after that. Um, and we'll talk about at the end, end of the lecture, steroid withdrawal. You've got to remember that a patient is now addicted to high levels of steroid. It's, it's horrible. It's causing a disease. They don't like it. But when you take it away, it's a horrible experience. And that's glucocorticoid withdrawal syndrome, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And so to anyone who's done taking patients through surgery or an adrenalectomy or anything else that quickly reduces the cortisol, you generally put them on three times physiologic levels, occasionally even higher than that, and you begin to wean them back down towards physiologic. And what I always did is I waited for a normal stem test of the adrenals before I took them off that last little bit of 20 milligrams of hydrocortisone, that physiologic dose. Uh, so patients that are not candidates for a transsonoidal, in my experience, most patients are candidates, uh, but if they're not, you can certainly go to medical therapy. And then second line therapy when, when transsonoidal surgery was not successful. And then the other is in patients that are waiting for the effects of radiotherapy. It can take years for the radiotherapy to have, to reach its plateau, whatever effect it's going to have. And so sometimes having a medical therapy as a bridge can be important. Then you give somebody holidays from that medical therapy and you see what the cortisol level does. So what are the categories? Well, the first is somatostatin analogs, um, or I should say pituitary directed um, um, treatment. So somatostatin analogs, uh, so people have used octreotide, uh, which is the first kind of first generation somatostatin analog. It's not typically effective. There is a, a newer drug called pazureotide, which I'm gonna talk a little bit about because that's, that's a drug now that currently managed by Recordati was developed at Novartis, and it's a centrally acting drug, but it predominantly hits somatostatin receptor 5, which is very common in ACTH-producing tumors. So pazureotide has effectiveness in Cushing's. Uh, another centrally acting drug, you know, if you go to the literature, has sort of mixed results. Clinically, people find it as mixed results are dopamine agonists. So cabergoline is, is probably the most common. And people will often try that early on, and they say, look, I know it's not likely to, to work, but if it does, I've now treated a patient with a, a fairly safe, inexpensive drug, and so it's at least worth, worth a try. So these are the two categories, somatostatin analogs and dopamine receptor uh, agonists are the centrally acting drug. 
Then there are the adrenal-directed drugs. And there's a whole list of drugs that have been available historically, ketoconazole, metirapone, probably two of the most common uh, historically used in the U.S. A newer drug, and now also by Recordati, Ocelodrostat or uh, Isterisa, is a very potent 11-beta-hydroxylase uh, inhibitor, and, uh, and I'll show you some data on that as well. Um, the, the challenges with steroidogenesis inhibitors is they don't target the corticotrope-producing tumor, the pituitary tumor. Uh, we still have long-term uh, uh, treatment durability um, questions and safety and tolerability on a number of these drugs where you're completely leaving the, potentially leaving the patient adrenally insufficient. And so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that on, on the, uh, the AE profile on some of these drugs. And then the last category is glucocorticoid receptor antagonists. Um, that, those are drugs, uh, mifepristone, RU46, uh, was approved, I think, in 2012. So it's been out for a little over 10 years. Uh, and it's been a very effective drug and has become very popular uh, in a lot of clinics. Uh, you can't measure cortisol, but you can measure the effects of hypercortisolemia, and that can be used to then monitor uh, the levels levels of the drug. And hopefully anybody uh, that was listening to me from any other company talking about these drugs would say that I gave a fair and balanced uh, 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 description of, of each of these drugs. For the remainder, I'm going to focus on the drugs that have come out of Recordati, and I'll, I'll do a deep dive on that, and we'll actually look at some of the data. Um, the radiation therapy is another non-medicinal form of treatment for Cushing's. As I mentioned, it, it, there's different forms of it. There's conventional, which is fractionated, done over a five- to six-week span, where you can do a stereotactic, where all the beams are then focusing in uh, on one spot. You can see schematically here, sh frying the, that, that tumor uh, and the pituitary remission rates up to 83 uh, percent. Patients can sometimes take years to have the effect. It may not work. The patients can get headaches, etc. So there, it's it's not a, a cure-all uh, treatment for failed medicine uh, for failed surgery, uh, but it's certainly in the in the treatment uh, algorithm. And then finally, bilateral adrenalectomy. You would think this you know it's listed here as a last resort. Some people will use it more uh, early in the algorithm. Uh, the good news is you're getting out the adrenals. The bad news is the patient's completely adrenally insufficient, which you can simply replace them with steroid. Uh, lots of people are adrenally insufficient for a variety of reasons. The other problem is, don't forget, uh, there's about 10, 15% of patients have adrenal rest tissue. So the surgeon goes in, takes out the adrenal glands, and you still have tissue producing cortisol in response to the ACTH. So none of these therapies are perfect. Uh, and none of the therapies, including the medicine. So we're, we're still working on this, and we hope to have continued better medicines and management of Cushing's over the years. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about Ocelodrostat, or the trade name is Isteresa. So Isteresa basically blocks the last step in cortisol production from starting with cholesterol. It's a 11-beta-hydroxylase inhibitor, or CYP11B1, um, and... Uh, that it's very potent. It shuts off steroid. There virtually is not a patient that we can't normalize the cortisol, um, but you just have to weigh that in and the risks of adrenal insufficiency and some of the other AEs uh, and how to manage. The, one of the biggest challenges in, in, in utilization of a strong uh, steroid inhibitor is people often that are using it are not they don't recognize that if you drop steroid for any reason, you're going to put a patient into steroid withdrawal, and they're not going to feel so good. And so it's often patients, you know, I would always warn patients after pituitary surgery or adrenalectomy, I'd say, you're going to hate me for 6 to 12 weeks because I'm going to make you worse before I make you better. But if you can get through that and pay the piper and go through that withdrawal, and I'll do it as gently as I can by giving you replacement steroid, Come out, coming out the tail end, you're going to be better off, and you're going to begin to get your life back. So just understanding the potency of these drugs uh, really will help to be able to, to manage your patients. Uh, just in terms of um, overall, uh, it was FDA approved in March of 2020, so we're about, uh, we're, we're into, our, into our third year now of uh, 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 experience clinically with the drug. Uh, the dosing is uh, per label, two milligrams orally twice a day, uh, and is not food sensitive. 
The average dose uh, in the clinical studies was up to between two and seven milligrams twice a day. And uh, it's absorbed very rapidly after oral administration. It's got a fairly short half-life. And so people think if you stop the drug, you're gonna immediately have the cortisol begin to go up. That's often true, but it's not always true. And if you, uh, the, the, link four, uh, the link three study I'm gonna show you in a minute, which was randomized withdrawal, um, over an eight week span, there were still 20%, tw over 20% of the patients were still quote, normalized on the drug, even though they had been taken off the drug on this randomized withdrawal, which says that in some patients, there's a prolonged effect that goes simply beyond uh, the uh, uh, Isteresa Ocelodistrat drug levels. Uh, efficacy in trials, I'll show you this data here more in depth, but at 86.1% uh, in the randomized withdrawal design, 29%, I said, I said above 20, but 29.4% when switched to placebo, which is much higher than one would expect, which really is explained by there's a longer tail, a longer effect in some patients treated with, uh, with uh, Ocelodrostat uh, than, than others. Um, Okay, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk more about this data in just a little bit, so I'll, I'll leave it here. Adverse events, those occurring at greater than 15% are nausea, headache, fatigue. Now, one could argue that this is good. These, these may not be, although they're uh, listed as adverse events, you want a patient to be going through mild steroid withdrawal. Remember, they gotta feel worse before they feel better. So some nausea, mild headaches, mild fatigue is actually probably a good sign. What you don't want is the nausea to be turning, you know, where it's dysfunctional, turning into vomiting, headaches where it's dysfunctional, fatigue where they can't get out of bed. Then we've probably gone beyond steroid withdrawal and we're now into the realm of pushing into adrenal insufficiency. And if you don't intervene, the patient's actually going to get into trouble, which is then the next category, adrenal insufficiency, uh, nasopharyngitis, kind of seen in all studies. I don't know what that has to do with this drug. And then the vomiting probably relates back to that nausea and 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 continued too far into that spectrum into adrenal insufficiency without giving the appropriate replacement steroid. Uh, other precautions, we met, already talked about the hypocortisolism, there's some QTC prolongation, and then elevations in adrenal hormone precursors and androgens. Um, some people have been concerned because there's an elevation in testosterone and some of the androgens that there's gonna be worsening of hirsutism. It turns out that's not the case and I can get into um, some of the reasons on that, but there's counter hormones that have also effects on the androgenizing uh, uh, impact of, of the drug. And uh, so these, these hormones seem to be counterbalanced. And so when you actually look at hirsutism in our studies, uh, there's most people don't have any change in their hirsutism and more patients improve in their hirsutism profile than worsen. So yes, testosterone goes up. It does tend to come down over time, but the androgenizing effect does not seem to be as predominant in many patients. It is certainly seen in some, um, and so that needs to certainly be taken into consideration. Okay, so let's talk about LINK3. LINK3 was the study that was used for FDA approval. It was also used for um, uh, the EMA approval. It was the randomized withdrawal design. I'm not gonna talk about LINK4 just for time purposes. Uh, LINK4 came out a year or so later and it's a placebo control trial study. But LINK3, uh, you can see patients are placed on Ocelodrostat. They're titrated up to a therapeutic dose. Those that normalized were then randomized to stop uh, their uh, uh, Ocelodrostat a half being left on it, half being then put on placebo, and then the comparison of what the result was at the end of the uh, um, a randomized withdrawal phase. Uh, and then those patients were then allowed to go into an extension uh, up to week 48. So dose titration, those that are effectively treated get put into the randomized withdrawal phase, those that were not were then just followed, and then ultimately patients could be followed long-term. So, very potent drug, and as you can see, most patients uh, had uh, a marked improvement in their, um, uh, in their uh, urine-free cortisol, so a uh, response rate of about 86% in those patients in the, in the withdrawal arm that were continued on Ocelodrostat 
about 29.4% in those patients that switched to placebo. So clearly the drug is having an effect. 96.4% uh, of the patients normalized their UFC at some point during the study. And anyone who manages the disease recognizes that even a well-controlled patient, like a diabetic, right, occasionally your sugars will go up, hypertension, occasionally your, your hypertension will go up. Even in managing patients with Cushing's, occasionally uh, your urine-free cortisols will go up. And so looking at it at a cross-section of time, you're going to always have a worse outcome than what you're probably going to see clinically. And when you ask the question, how many patients are effectively being treated? Are we normalizing at some point? It's actually over 90%, over 95%. And then 66% are maintaining that normal urine-free cortisol for at least six months. Um, here is the, the change in urine-free cortisol from baseline. And again, you can see some of these patients were markedly hypercortisolemic, and you can get dramatic reduction in the cortisol levels in these patients. Uh, sometimes people erroneously make the mistake that the higher your cortisol, you can just jump in with higher doses. Uh, we had a poster at Endo Society last year, uh, Rich Aukis was the first author, where a patient that came in 70 times the upper limit of normal, not a UFC of 70, but 70 times the upper limit of normal completely normalized on two milligrams twice a day, the starting dose. So it's it's always a good idea to start at the starting dose. It's recommended. Some people even start a little bit lower if I'm a, to be cautious and then begin to work your way up, titrating down the dose to where you want it to, to dose. And you can see even patients that had mild hypercortisolemia were, were effectively treated. So severe patients to mild patients, it just simply is, a, this is a titratable drug. Um, Okay, so here is looking at the data slightly differently. Now it's looking at the the dose in, in blue compared to the UFC. So as you go up in dose, you're continuing to drop the UFC towards normal range. Again, don't just say, I'm going to jump to a high dose to get normal because you can get yourself into trouble uh, pretty quickly. So start the phrase that we use in the, in the company and a lot of doctors use, you'll hear the phrase, start low and go slow. Uh, and you will generally have very good experience with the drug. Okay, uh, then in terms of non-cortisol, uh, obviously um, reduction in uh, systolic or diastolic blood pressure, reduction in weight, reduction in weight circumference, uh, blood sugars, and hemoglobin A1C, reductions in these are all good, and that's all the trend that it went. Uh, on the Cushing's qual, you want to have an increase in those scores. So that means the patient's happier, doing well. The, the one thing that goes the other direction is the Beck depression inventory down is good. And so we're seeing everything going in the right direction as these patients are being treated effectively for their hypercortisolemia. Uh, on terms of adverse events, again, over 15%, these most common ones, nausea, headache, and fatigue, in many cases may actually be a good sign the drug is working. You just wanna make sure you're following them and make sure they're not going into adrenal insufficiency. Uh, and if they go too far, you can end up with uh, vomiting, glucocorticoid deficiency, and, and then a variety of other things. So. It's other than this, the, the effects of dropping cortisol, there's, it's a fairly good uh, AE profile. And uh, how to interpret the dropping of the cortisol symptoms really is in the eye of the beholder. One thing we don't want to do is push so fast, the patient goes into adrenal insufficiency, as that can be life-threatening. Um, and here's basically that same data uh, shown a different way. And then finally, looking at uh, extension, uh, you can see that over the population of patients treated, once they are normalized, they stay normalized, even going into uh, another year of extension and following these patients. So nice durability of response of the patients. Okay, so in summary, a significantly higher proportion of patients in the Ocelodrostart arm maintained median urine-free cortisol response at the end of eight-week randomized withdrawal period, which is week 34, versus placebo, so 86.1% normalized versus 29.4. There was rapid and sustained reduction in urine-free cortisol. Patients treated with Ocelodrostat showed improvement in the clinical features of hypercortisolism, hypercortisolism including the Cushing's Qual score and depression. And Ocelodrostat was generally well tolerated with no unexpected side effects, meaning most of the side effects are related to the, the, the dropping of the cortisol. Okay, so I'm gonna very quickly just touch on uh, pazureotide. As I mentioned, it has very high efficacy for somatostatin receptor 5, which is why, and that's fairly common in, in pituitary tumors. Uh, 
you can see again, this was the uh, sub-Q studies, um, nice reduction in cortisol in most patients. Um, in looking at the 600 milligram group, and I'll show this even more clearly in the next slide, about 15% uh, completely normalized their UFC at the end. Uh, it did not have statistical significance in the 600 uh, group. Um, am I saying that backwards? Uh, yeah, sorry, 15% in the 600 group. It did not hit it in the in the 900 group because they had a much lower uh, starting place. So the relative reduction in the in the cortisol was uh, was more significant in the 600. Um, if you look at tumor volume, um, uh, you can see, again, in that 900 group, you're getting uh, a better reduction in uh, tumor shrinkage, uh, and both reduce at 12 months, but even greater in the 900 group, so there is tumor volume shrinkage. This was a little bit hard in that a lot of these tumors were relatively small, and most of the effects, as seen in typically with uh, somatostatin analogs, were GI some cholelithiasis, headaches, abdominal pain, fatigue. These may, again, be related to the dropping of the cortisol. The thing that is important to note is there was hyperglycemia and diabetes with the drug. So not only is somatostatin receptor 5 in the, in the Cushing's ACTH-producing pituitary tumor, it's also in the islet cells of the, of the pancreas, and so it, it can shut off insulin or reduce insulin, and so it, it increases uh, glucose levels in many patients. The label says up to 60, 80 percent of patients. They use the word diabetes. It's probably more correctly uh, out of the studies that I showed you, where you're actually increasing uh, hyper uh, cortisol, uh, hyper glucose related events. It may be one time throughout the study, and it gets dinged. Um, we also have some data in another study called B2219, where about a third of the patients that did not have diabetes coming in ended up getting diabetes level. So the number I generally use is about a third of true diabetes, about 60 80% have some hyperglycemic event at some point during their treatment. And then LAR, so there's two forms. There's a sub-Q and then the more commonly used LAR form. And again, uh, two different doses, 10 and 30 milligrams. Uh, and then depending on what their experience is, they can go, if they're on 30, they can go up to 40, or if they started on 10, they can go up to 30 and then look for the primary endpoint at seven months, regardless of dose of titration. Uh, so on the 10 milligram, they're very similar results, about 42% on 10 milligrams, about 41% on 30 milligrams, basically equivalent. So fairly good efficacy on the LAR. Um, and if you actually then look at mild patients, it's, it's over 50% efficacy uh, in both treatment groups. And again, you see improvement in systolic, diastolic weight, waist circumference, and BMI, and the Cushing score improves, all things going in the correct direction. And tumor volume, again, shrinks in both the 10 milligram and 30 milligram, which is what you would expect in, in, in a drug, a somatostatin analog that's working because it's centrally effective at the tumor itself. Uh, the, the AE profile is similar to the short acting. Number one thing you're gonna see uh, is hyperglycemia. Uh, and you just have to be ready to manage that. You do have improved efficacy, um, good efficacy uh, compared to uh, the, uh, uh, in another study uh, where it was looked compared to somatostat, the first generation somatostatin analogs, uh, very good efficacy, but the trade-off is in some patients you'll have to manage some hyperglycemia. And then a lot of the GI stuff we had already talked about. Um, and then you, this is, these are the shift tables. So if a patient starts off at normal, uh, uh, glucose, so 41% normal, 23% uh, then shift to prediabetes and up to 68 uh, shift to diabetes from those patients that were the minority of patients that were normal at baseline. Remember, patients have hypercortisol, hyperglycemia as part of the disease, and so you'll often be managing this, but the, the pasreotide can make it worse. And then the final thing, and I'll say, I, I really talked about this throughout the talk, but just to remember that patients with long-standing Cushing's disease have uh, cortisol or steroid resistance, and they go through a withdrawal as it begins to normalize. If you take them through that withdrawal too quickly, they can go into frank adrenal insufficiency. So the way to manage it is to bring down that steroid level slowly, either by putting them on replacement steroid and tapering it down slowly, 
or for drugs where you can titrate them up like hysteresa, uh, you can simply start low and up titrate slowly, which then effectively brings down the cortisol level slowly. And so with that, I will end. And if there's uh, in the last five minutes or so, if uh, questions come up, I'm happy to try and address them. And you can either do those over the chat or if I don't know if it's possible to come and ask them live. Okay, and I tell me if I'm missing on the chat. Let's see. Okay, so it looks like there's some questions. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm seeing people were commenting on the CME uh, because I'm, I'm from industry. They did not want to give CME credit, even though I was trying to give a you know completely fair and balanced analysis of the disease and the drugs. Uh, any questions from anybody that I can address in the last five minutes or so? Oh, uh, Dr. Ladlam, this yep. is Satya Krishna Sami. Uh, thank you for the great overview. So uh, my question was this, and I, you went through the algorithm um, in, um, early on, and I see our neurosurgeons also on the um, uh, call. So when do you decide about um, either the auxiliary Silverstat or um, using pesetide. I know the diabetes, which I remember from the board questions from 10 years ago that the diabetes right. is an issue. But right. when do you decide uh, which one uh, to use among these two? So, Well, I can tell you, I'll, I'll speak as a clinician, you know, ultimately it is, it's, it's a clinical choice and, and like every drug you, you sort of weigh out in the individual patient, you know, pesetide long acting as an injection. And it's it's a once a month injection. It's painful, uh, so some patients are going to shy away from that. That with the hyperglycemia. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if it works, it works great, and mm -hmm. you don't have to deal with it for 27 days a month. Mm -hmm. uh, so some people like that. Uh, maybe an insurance issue. The Ocelodrostat. It's a twice a day oral. Uh, it's mm -hmm. very potent. Um, from an economics perspective, I I think probably the patient experience is pr fairly similar. Uh, costs to the patient, so mm -hmm. I don't think that's as much of a concern. Um, mm -hmm. Some people want to have the centrally acting effects of the pazureotide. They like the idea that it's hitting centrally, and you can get some tumor shrinkage out of it. If you have a tumor that's visible and it's and you're, it's keeping you up at night, pazureotide may be oh. a great option. But uh, mm -hmm. oselodostat, hysteresa, very potent, and there's really nobody at the end of the day that you're not going to normalize their cortisol. So the, my other question is, so yeah, it, I tried getting pesetide recently for a patient and of course insurance wouldn't, we finally had to go through good old um, ketoconazole, but that's outside of the- Why, why uh, wouldn't the insurance? Um, it was mostly uh, the cost of it and they weren't will, unwilling to cover, but I'm sure I can you know ask about it later. But yeah. uh, how do you start like monitoring the 24 hour UFC or how often and how frequently do these yeah. patients need to be seen? I'd go to the label for the official recommendations mm -hmm. from, from the FDA, but generally, you know, these drugs will take a little bit of time to have effect. Um, I am more worried about lowering it too quickly than not mm -hmm. quickly enough. So I will generally come in, you know, a urine-free cortisol isn't always the best way. You know, if you to get a low urine-free cortisol, you're probably mm -hmm. pretty adrenally insufficient. So I'd be following symptoms mm -hmm. and cortisol levels serum uh, for signs of adrenal insufficiency. And I'd be measuring, again, go to the label, but just intuitively when I would manage patients, uh, particularly initially, I think I'd bring them back for a six-week urine-free cortisol and then mm -hmm. three months and then every three months and then finally every six months and then finally yearly uh, if mm -hmm. I think they're... Um, responding. The good news is in this disease is it's very symptomatic, both low and high. Mm -hmm. And That's so I'm right. talking to my patient. I'm saying, how are you feeling? Mm -hmm. And rarely am I trying to come in with another intervention when the patient says, I'm happy. If they're happy, I'm happy. And oh, yes, so, yes. Right? So yeah, that's, uh, keep that in yeah, mind. It's a, it's a very difficult disease. So, and the patient's yeah. feeling better is like a great thing. It's a great day for everybody. My, Absolutely. um, so one of the other questions I had was more early in the talk, and this is more for everyone's learning, is Cushing's patients also have major mental health issues uh, like insomnia, don't sleep very well at, at night, and then 
sometimes the one milligram dex, you know, somebody, it's almost like they're nocturnal. So, and uh, it's not as, you know, sometimes it's a little tricky. And then the late night salivary cortisol, again, is the same thing. We tell them at midnight, but they are probably going to sleep at 3 a.m., 4 a.m. So how do you, and just like Dr. Finling said, you know, if you misdiagnose or miss it, it's, you know, there's a lot of good reasons. So how do yeah. you sort of I, get I around like, those issues? Yeah, I was one of the early adopters. Uh, mm -hmm. So Jay Finling and a guy named Herschel Raff really uh -huh. made mm -hmm. the, uh, the the salivary cortisol popular. And they had a, a, a lab, ACL. I've been out of it for a while, so I'm not even sure if ACL is still making uh -huh. the test anymore. But so ACL salivary is very popular for a while. I was an early adopter. I loved it. And what mm -hmm. I would say is, if your patient's up at three in the morning, they probably have high cortisol in the middle of the night, and you're going to pick it up with the midnight. I wouldn't. Mm -hmm. I would be measuring it at a time because you're going to compare it to what a normal person is, and a normal mm -hmm. person at midnight uh, should have cortisols very low in their in their That's saliva. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And one time, actually, and if you look at the original papers, it was all. At 11, 11 p.m., and I asked Herschel Raff one day, I said, Herschel, why in the world, everything mm -hmm. else is based on midnight cortisols. Why were you measuring it uh, at 11? He says, well, we couldn't get anyone else in Milwaukee to get up at, uh, stay up past midnight. So, wow. so they measured for their early tests at 11, but it's the same idea. Uh -huh. 11, mm -hmm. 12, your cortisol mm -hmm. should be low. So I would stick with a midnight cortisol level. Okay. Okay. That's good to know. Thank you. I think there's one question in the chat. I see. I see it. Uh, Unless I'm missing it, the only one I see is uh, about is the tumor volume. Is there another tumor one? volume measurement? Oh, okay. You're yeah, tumor volume. Mm -hmm. So how how is it measured? Um, generally, it's you measure volume with MRIs, and then you you get three three cross sections of the MRI, and you can get a measurement of the tumor in the three sections, and then you can create a, essentially a volume uh, of the tumor. In Cushing's, they tend to be fairly small, and so that you know you're basically just picking up a microadenoma, maybe a half centimeter uh, in, in 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 dimension. But the larger tumors, you can begin to get a much more accurate volume. Hopefully, that answers the question. So, with the also I understand if uh, if ACTH levels might be expected to rise, what experience is there with enlargement of the tumor over time? Yeah, it's a great, great question. It's always the one that everyone was worried at the beginning. But I think if you'll look at, that's the same question with ketoconazole or with, with uh, metiropone, right? They're centrally acting, lowering the, the steroid. Are you going to get elevations? So just, so so um, on, on my introduction, I, I was told who, who I had worked with at OHSU. So I, I won't put a name to it, but I was told early on by one of, one of my mentors that kind of really questioned the whole idea of that there is sort of this, this Nelson syndrome where you're simply because you're lowering cortisol, you're now going to get out of control tumor production. And actually, um, the, the experience people have had with these drugs kind of support that. We're not seeing tumor enlargement any higher than you would normally see in clinical practice. So in any of these studies, there was no tumor enlargement with reducing cortisol levels by blocking uh, the cortisol levels at at the um, at the uh, at the adrenal. Now you're not making somebody adrenally insufficient, right? So you're not theoretically getting higher ACTH. You ought to just pretty much be normalizing your ACTH levels. Now you are shutting it off at the adrenal. If there is a pituitary tumor, you could get some continued growth and and increasing in ACTH. But that's that's just not what people were seeing. Uh, we're not getting skin darkening. We're not seeing signs of Nelson's enlarging tumor and, and, and elevating uh, ACTH levels. So how long has the longest duration been in terms of the studies? Uh, yeah. How, how long so, do you keep it? Yeah, so, the, the, so if you just go by the number, I said the link three, well, there's probably then a link two and a link one. If you go back to link one, um, actually a funny story, I, I had just joined Novartis in 2012 and somebody dropped on my desk, a paper about a drug called LCI 699, which was a development name for Oslodrostat, and it was originally being developed as an anti as an antihypertensive, but because of its um, 
uh, effects on fluid balance. It turned out not to be a very good antihypertensive, but it was making everybody adrenally insufficient. But those patients out of LINK-1 2012, we still have patients that are on drugs. So we've got over a decade, uh, some patients in extension uh, experience on the drug. So it's, it's been very good. You don't get habituation. You don't get loss of effect. And once you normalize that cortisol and find the right dose, um, patients are very, do very well long term. So is the tumor size one of the predictors of response? Well, I heard two questions in there. Are there any drug-drug interactions that you should be concerned with? Um, so anything that has QT prolongation, you'd want to be cautious with. Most of the drugs that you would use in pituitary patients, you're not having effects. One of the questions we often get is, well, why not use pazureotide and Isteresa together? It's possible you get a centrally acting and a peripherally acting drug. There could be some synergies. The problem is we, we don't have a huge appetite for that because they both have potential QT prolongation and could theoretically, it's not been shown, but could have uh, increased effects. So generally, uh, there's fairly low drug-drug interactions, uh, particularly um, in the drugs that we're typically using in treating pituitary patients, so any of the diabetes drugs, any hypertensives, et cetera. So my question was about um, predictors of response, like you know, is tumor size the only thing that you can go by or? Well, it's a great question. and. My belief and what really we talk about and what the studies have shown is that any patient is a candidate. Now, by the way, I, one thing I didn't emphasize and I should have early on, the FDA, you looking at the same data as the EMA, uh, FDA approved it in Cushing's disease and the EMA appro approved it in Cushing's syndrome. So hypercort endogenous hypercortisolemia of any etiology, and they said, well, gee, the drug works at the adrenal glands. doesn't matter what the etiology is. It's going to shut it off. FDA said, hey, you studied in pituitary tumors. We're going to approve you in pituitary tumors. So keep that in mind. Uh, we would never talk about utilizing it in non-pituitary. I can tell you about 20% of the, the, the usage is uh, in non-pituitary and People are using it and having good experiences as, as they are in Europe, but that's, it's an off-label usage. Uh, predictors, you know, I mentioned, and this was a really, we've now done some real-world studies. The problem, the phase three studies are wonderful for answering very specific questions, but you don't get great real-world experience. And now that we've begun to look at some real-world data, it's been shocking where some patients, as I mentioned, this one that Rich showed, 70 times the upper limit of normal, completely normalized on two milligrams BID. And then I have other patients that have very mild hypercortisolemia that you're getting up to seven, 10 milligrams twice a day. So it really is start low, titrate slow, but titrate, titrate up until you have effect. And in terms of predictors, it, it's gonna shut off cortisol on just about everybody when you get the dose to the, to the uh, up high enough. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Wonderful, thank you.